afternoon, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I'm Callum from sunny Basildon, and uh, opposite me again, thankfully, is uh, Scott from sunny Southend. How you doing? Hello. Hello. I'm good, mate. I'm good. You? Good, man. Yes, very good. Yeah, glad to be back for uh, episode two and uh, excited great. to dive into, into this one. Um, before we get into it, just wanted to give a shout out to our first episode and to those who listened. Um, yes. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we appreciated the interactions and uh, the feedback that we received from everyone. It was, uh, mm. yeah, it was awesome. It's, you know, it's always one of those things that you're unsure as to how things are going to be received. And someone was actually listening. People were actually <laughs> listening. <Yeah. laughs> Thank goodness. Not to start swaffling for for two over two hours people were actually I know, uh, right? listening to it so no so thank you for that obviously if, if for future episodes including this one if uh if listeners do want to interact um you know give us your own sort of thoughts and theories then we are on the socials now uh Always. facebook and uh instagram at the moment um, at cryptid ramblers podcast you'll find us uh on both of those so send us your messages your theories you know what you uh you know what you believe what you don't and also any subjects that you might want us to go into uh for future episodes any any particular creature or folklore or scary story that you've mm. heard that you want scott and i to deep dive into then um you know by all means let us know yes, um indeed but uh without further ado let's jump straight into episode two this week uh, or this episode we are going to be discussing the creature cryptid uh, unknown man injured cold Injured cold. Um, yeah, now it might be a name that some some of the listeners may have, have heard of, um, or it might be completely new to you. It's certainly uh, an interesting character, certainly an interesting story. Um, you know, and of course, we're going to dive into it. it. Interestingly, it didn't have the same number of accounts or you know sightings or um, just stories, really that. That certainly that Bigfoot had. I mean, that's been you know going over you oh, know yeah. sort of hundreds of years. So that had that was really rich in information. This one really not so. It all really sort of derived from this kind of one story that uh, I know you're going to jump into, um, yep. Scott, a little later on. Um, but I think it was important really just to cover kind of what is believed to be um, the origins and the, the sort of first sighting of the. The man, the alien known as uh, Mr. Injured Cold. Um, he goes by a couple of different names as well, though, doesn't he? A couple it's of different a... names, yeah, which I think is, is also derived from this initial um, in- encounter, um, which uh, which I'll certainly mention. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I suppose much like Bigfoot, it, it, it depends on who you speak to, he's got mm. a different description and he's got a different, uh, you know, he's got a different name. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the first, uh, first encounter uh, is reported to have occurred on the 16th of October in 1966. Uh, mm-hmm. Two boys, uh, two, two young lads, uh, Martin Munyov and James Yanchitis, hopefully I've said those right, um, from Elizabeth, New Jersey, um, of course, the USA, uh, walking down a local street, 4th Street, for anyone who's, uh, who's interested. Um, they saw a surreal figure standing near a fence now, I believe it was Martin that saw it first because he was, uh, I think James had his back to the fence. Um, and so I think Martin said to him, Jimmy, who, do you know that guy who's right behind you? Because apparently, apparently he was, you know, sort of quite close. And Jimmy said, what guy? Sort of turns around. And as they both turn around, they see this this man, this this surreal mm. figure, as they as they initially uh, referred to him as basically standing the, on the other side of a sort of metal fence, the ones you would sort of see on a uh, construction site. Yeah, one of those wire fences. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, he was just sort of standing there um, on the other side in, in a sort of an opening, a, a clearing of sorts, um, quite close to a cliff edge, if I remember rightly. Okay. Um, and as they got closer to obviously see what, you know, who this guy was and, you know, sort of what he wanted – they saw that he was a tall, bald man wearing a metallic green suit. Um, and he was just staring back at them with a huge grin plastered mm. across his face. And this obviously relates back to what you were saying, Scott, about the one of the other names. Yeah. Um, the Grinning Man 
is uh, right. what has also been penned uh, for the bit, same uh, the same person. Bit more um, sinister. Yeah, quite sinister, sort of almost like Joker esque, sort of. Yeah, you know, that's the sort to... of image it conjures, isn't it? Yeah, sort of from ear to ear type smirk or, or grin. Um, now, when he noticed the two boys and that they were looking at him quite intently, uh, the uh, the figure uh, began chasing them. Uh, this lasted for. I think a, a, a few blocks, uh, mm. or sort of, you know, a couple of streets um, before they eventually lost him. Um, never, you know, didn't sort of see him again and, you know, kind of went about their business. It, it wasn't until, you know, kind of later on, whether it was that day or, you know, in the coming days that they actually recalled the encounter um, and actually told other people about it. I think like most people, when they have these sort of experiences, they, they don't necessarily want to tell people because, you know, yeah. They'll be laughed at. They'll be mocked, called course, crazy, yeah. and and all that. And again, this was you know around a time when you know a lot of this would have been hogwash and hocus mm. pocus, and probably not many you know sort of true believers. Um, one of the sort of telling um, sort of descriptions that they gave later on in their um, sort of recollection was that he didn't really have any distinguishing features sort of on his mm. on his face. So he, he, they recall that he didn't have any ears and he didn't have a nose, uh, yeah. just a big wide grin um, but plastered, Lord Voldemort, plastered across then. the face. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much <laughs> Voldemort, really. Yeah, because they all see, um, and now they all see related to the fact that he was sort of tall and, and quite broad uh, as well. Uh, so that was the, yeah, that was the first encounter. Um back in uh, yeah October of 66 uh, mm. which i think leads into quite nicely the the sort of the main the main encounter which we're going to discuss in sort of a little yes. bit more detail so uh I'll hand over to you it does it does indeed um so we're looking at um less than a month later um it was on the 2nd of November 1966 um as a, approximately half past 7 in the evening Mm-hmm. There was Woodrow Derenberger, um, who was a sewing machine salesman from Mineral Wells, West Virginia. Um, he was heading home from Marriott, Ohio, where he'd done a couple of sales. Um, okay. And just before he reached the, inter- inter- uh, the interchange with Route 47, he was overtaken okay. by a car and followed closely by um, another vehicle, which initially he thought was another car. Yeah. Um, it became apparent to him that it wasn't another car, but it was actually a craft of some sort. It gained speed and travelled further ahead um, and began to turn in the middle of the road. Now, as it travelled, it was about 8 to 10 inches off the ground and spanned the width of the road as it turned. So this is a two-lane interstate. So that means it's four lanes wide. Right. Um, He describes the vehicle as looking like an old kerosene lamp on its side and charcoal grey in colour and around 30, 35 feet um, in length and a height of around about 10 feet. And as this craft came to came in front of um, the truck, um, it began to decelerate until it completely stopped, bringing Derenberger to a stop mm. also. The vehicle remained off the ground as the door opened to the side, mm. like a car door, um, and a smiling man stepped out. Yeah. Didn't something so spook he, him before he... Was it before he stopped? Was it? Didn't he have? Yes, he had it, it, stuff on the back the of his truck, and didn't a radio or something fall off one of his sewing machines or something? And that's right. And fell out and of he the tried, truck. He, he flicked on the the dome light, the interior that light, to yeah. have a closer was. look. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing he was going to look to kind of lean, like reach back and reach back sort, sort out it whatever or, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's when he saw that vehicle coming past. That's right. Um, yeah. but yeah, the, the, a, a smiling man stepped yeah. out of this this craft um the smiling man stepped out and in and 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 the sh- and the craft itself actually mm. shot straight back up into the air around 70 to 100 feet and remained there for the entirety of the encounter mm. it made a um a low fluttering sound like 
um, and I'll quote this from Darren Berger's interview because he had an interview literally yes. the, the following night, um, which you can actually find, um, you can find the transcript and you can find the actual interview, interview on itself. YouTube, yeah. um, which we'll put in the socials so you can go and have a listen to it. Yeah, and we'll share a link. See yeah. what you think of it as well. Um, and he said the, the, it sounded like the blades of a helicopter that was idling, um, sitting on the ground, but not very loud. Mm. Um the smiling man was wearing a top coat with a zipper down the front. Uh, the coat was a dark blue, shiny material, something his wife would later describe as a hard fabric. Um, again, mm. that's something you can Google. It gives you a better idea, better vision. Of, it's a better visualisation, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the trousers were a slightly lighter shade of blue, um, but a similar material was the coat. He appeared to, he appeared to be around six foot tall weighing about 180, 185 pounds. Um, yeah. Now, it seems like uh, Darren Berger is a good judge of um, weight to height ratio um, right, because yeah. he demonstrates this to, to the interviewer, um, which I've got all of this information from. Yeah, it's from the following um, day, wasn't it? The... Yeah, it's, the mo- it's probably the most accurate because it's the earliest retelling of this event. So that's why I've yeah. chosen this one in particular. Mm, that makes sense. Um, so he walked toward Derenberger's truck with his arms folded um, and with his hands under each armpit um, and asked Derenberger to roll down the passenger side window. As he approached the window, Derenberger noticed that he looked like any other human that was about. You mm. just see him on the street and you wouldn't bat an eye. Which his is face interesting like... because the, the two young lads from only two or three months before claims yeah. that there weren't any distinguishing sort of features so almost like sort of a plain featureless sort almost of like face. a blank canvas yeah. with no no nose and no That's ears right. it, it's hmm. a very very different account yeah absolutely. Um, but obviously again we, with the, the lads in new jersey there's no mention of a spaceship or anything like that just a strange no. looking man that's smiling and yeah you know wearing a, a shiny suit yeah so he looked like any other a normal human being out there. Um, his face looked like he had a deep tan, like he'd recently been on holiday. His hair had combed back and a dark brown. He said that he was a good-looking man and looked perfectly normal. Mm. The, smiling set, the smiling man said that he would like to talk to Derenberger. Mm. That's when he noticed the smiling man's mouth wasn't moving. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. He was actually being spoken to telepathically. He was also he was so frightened of this he couldn't actually answer the smiling. So the smiling man asked him, "Why are you frightened? Don't be frightened. We wish you no harm. Hmm. We mean you no harm. We wish you only happiness." Again, telepathically. It's interesting that he uses the word "we" as well because he's only the the royal "we" or yeah, exactly. (laughs) Approached him on his own, but references that you know he's not. He's not there alone, so you know. Yeah, you know, other yeah, people. It's on an the odd one. It's, an, it's odd phrasing, um, mm. and there's it. It seems like uh, there's odd phrasing going on throughout this interaction as well. Um, mm. So he 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 said to Derenberger that he could respond either mentally or verbally, whichever he felt more comfortable with. Mm. So the, the smiling man asked Derenberger what he is called, yeah. and said that his name was cold yeah and it was just cold so, at this point wasn't it there was just no, cold no other yeah iteration it was just yeah now i don't know if you listen to the interview itself mm. as well and i don't know if it's just Darren Berger's um west virginia accent but mm. it sounds like he says cold rather than cold so yeah i don't know whether that's the mean. difference in accent between ours and his but yeah I'm not sure. I don't know if it's cold. Hmm. Or, or... I think it might just be the, as you say, the pronunciation from, you know, due to his accent. Because I think in yeah. every, in all the literature you read, and you know, in any Absolutely. other, you know, any even the interviewers, when they ask him to repeat it, mm. they they say it back to him as as cold. Yeah. So it's, it's, um... I think yeah, but it's interesting if it if it's just been. You know, sort of lost in translation, and, and it, it, absolutely cold, because because it's to... it's it, the way in which he's phrasing some of the questions. What, he's asking Derenberger what he is called, not what is your name. What's your name? Yeah. What are you called? Um, yeah. So how do they then, sort of differentiate their 
their names or you know so mm-hmm. you, you know are you assigned a, a title or, or a name as opposed to you know a birthright or well, there's a know, thing about language as well there's a thing about mm. language that they realized that only recently that depending on the sort of language you speak, um, it helps to determine the way you think as well. Yeah, oh, okay. It's an interesting, interesting. one. You should, yeah. Yeah. You should have, try, look into that as well. Cause that's yeah. a, that's an interesting take on how this, this could possibly work. Yeah, definitely. Um, so cold goes on to ask Darren Berger, um, if he worked for a living, um, and if he had to work to live. So, mm. like, it, it it's interesting asking questions about a yeah. a, a society or a, something that he doesn't maybe quite understand yeah, um, yeah which which is, which is yeah which is why they believe he's he's there i'm sure you'll sort of come on to the the you know the reasoning obviously in the second encounter which we'll cover a little later on yeah, there's, we'll a cover little, that in a bit. there's a little reasoning as to why he's asking those um sort of questions as well mm. so then he he then Darren Berger then explains that he's a salesman, um, that the, what the actual process of that job means and what that title means. And Cole says that he is a searcher. Mm, that's it. Um, yeah. Doesn't seem to a, ever explain what he's searching for. Yeah. I, I, yeah if I it's, they, if searcher like... is maybe another word for explorer. Such, never, I don't so, know. He never confirms, even when they go more into the society, you know, with where injured cold is from and stuff. They they all see they mention jobs and stuff, but they never actually he never explains more about what his purpose was and, and why he why he was chosen mm. or, or why he came to Earth, other than to learn more about us as a species and, and our planet and you know how we sort of did things. I yeah, guess. yeah, it's it's like um, but so I mean, we'll go into the other the other encounters and the other bits and yeah, pieces course, that yeah. it seems like Cold is is interested in. But yeah. um, Cold then asked what the lights were in the distance, um, and mm. no point in or anything like that. No nod of the head as to where, but Derenberger instinctively knew that he meant Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia, yeah. which is the the local city. So Cold asked if it was a place where everyone lived, like everyone in that, mm. area, everyone lives in that area. And Darren Berg yeah. explained that, no, it's not exactly where people work, not exactly where they live, but it's also where they work. People travel yeah. in, travel out. More of a trade route of sorts. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Cole then, um, Cole said that where he was from, they call it a gathering. Yeah, that's right. Um, at, again, at that point then, that, Indrid Cole then speaks to Derenberger in his mind and says, Mr. Derenberger, look at me. Because Derenberger is a bit, you know, he's a bit odd. He's got this guy standing yeah. at his window. He's, he doesn't quite want to yeah. make eye contact with him. Well, I think so from what he says in his interview, he was, he was terrified. Yeah. You know, he was petrified as much Anyone as... Anyone would be. Well, of course, yeah. It would be a natural <laughs> reaction at that point. I think he's, you know, in fairness to him. And, you know, as much as, you know, Indrid Cold, you know, said to him, you know, don't be afraid. You know, we're not going to hurt you, you know, in that situation, if it's your, you know, if, if if you're not expecting it, it's the, you know, it's the first time, if it's something that you didn't quite believe in and now you're experiencing it, yeah. you're going to be beside yourself. You, you know, you're going to be, you know, you, you, you're you going to be shit yourself for want of a better phrase. Oh, absolutely. And so the you fact know, that he was twitching on the steering wheel, you know, looking out of his driver's window, looking straight ahead at the craft, unable to make eye, eye contact, mm. especially if you're, you know, receiving this conversation telepathically, you're, you know, you're probably going to, you don't you know, know where, you're, but... you're probably going to stare forward or or kind of look anywhere else but at the figure because that must be yeah. quite a unnerving thing to you know to kind of experience, right? Yeah, I mean, it it's, yeah. it seems it seems as well that Indrid Cold understands this as well because yes, he, there's something that Darren Berger also says is that throughout the the encounter he's very polite, very courteous. Mm. You know, he's not. He doesn't not look threatening. Pushy or yeah, absolutely. Although he's got he's a constant grin, it's welcoming and it's kind of almost settling in a way. Yeah, he, he didn't get would, any bad vibes hand, from him. No, absolutely. I mean, despite yeah. I mean, if you had a guy standing there in front of you with his arms folded like this, with a, a, a smile on his face, just yeah, on, on the side of a road you, at, in the dark. Yeah, I demonstrated it to Sam, and she was like, "Yeah, back off now." 
yeah. She she didn't like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, Which yeah, I don't like a, that. A natural Back reaction. Off. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but it seems like he it seems like Cole does his best to to yeah. kind of put Derenberger at ease. He he goes on to Definitely, say, yeah. "Look at me. Uh, don't be frightened. Look at me. Hmm. Why are you frightened of us? We eat, we breathe, we sleep, we bleed, even as you do. We are like you." Please don't do not be frightened. Yeah. Um, Cold went on to say to Darren Berger that he should report this incident to the local officials, and that at a later date he would come back and confirm the story. Which yeah. is something you don't ever hear about with other no. contactee stories. No. no. Um, Cold then stepped back from the vehicle's window and said, "Mr. Darren Berger, we will see you again." Again. Everything that Cold is saying is telepathically. Yeah. The craft that was suspending above the road began, uh, began to descend and Cold walked away. This time, the vehicle turned to face the way they were both going originally and the door opened again and Cold stepped back into the craft. Another arm emerged out of the craft yeah. and seemed to close the door. Which I think relates to the we that Cold referred to when he said, we mean you no harm. We only wish you the best. Yeah. So I think that's obviously, yeah, that they don't, wasn't traveling on his own, that's for sure. No, no, absolutely. But, um, it seems like, um, and then that, at that point, then that's when Darren Berger continued to drive home and yeah. walked back in the house, white as a ghost, and promptly told his wife exactly what had happened to him. Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting actually because his wife and daughter, um, obviously, your mind wouldn't jump to the conclusion that he'd seen something of that nature. Cause I think when, when he came in, as you say, he was white as a, a ghost. He was, you know, sort of visibly and physically shaking, uh, mm. quite unnerved from the whole experience. I think to a point where he actually says he doesn't remember getting home. He remembers the encounter stopping or, or ending and then the spacecraft mm. leaving. And then he's in his kitchen at home with his wife, trying to recall the whole encounter. But I think her first, concern was that he'd hit and killed someone yeah on, on the highway uh, or the interstate and that's why he was so visibly sort of scared i guess um shaken and sh- and yeah and shaken which is again an, mm. a natural you know a, a natural uh, reaction but the, the the wife obviously suggested to call the police um mm. and and sort of said what had happened and, and and interestingly they you know it wasn't you know they didn't just dismiss it and go yeah, okay ma'am you know we'll, we'll come out and see you and then never show up because apparently that same night they'd had two or three other um, phone calls into the local either sheriff's department or police department, however it's set up there, basically saying something had been seen in the sky or something had been seen, you know, landing in, you know, or yes. nearby fields, that kind of thing. And interestingly, when the police did arrive at Derenberger's house, um, apparently the story was so convincing that the police actually believed him. Yeah, so they didn't which dismiss doesn't it. often happen. No, they didn't treat him as crazy or, you know, get in the, you know, you know the the, the psych, you know, attendant or you know psychiatric doctor or anything. They, that you know, they they believe him. Um, mm. Which, which they I even think got for up me the is, next day and went into work as well, didn't they? It's he did. like, yeah, he just carried you on. Know, he didn't get sectioned. He didn't do anything, no. and that's he spoke to his boss who had connections with a local TV station. Um, and that's where that interview yeah. comes from. Um, yeah. But interestingly, it's, I mean, we'll go over some of the other sort of sightings or, or encounters hmm. um, in, you know, a bit later on, but specifically on that same night, which is, which is, I think what added to the police believing Derenberger was that a man had phoned in, as, as I said, to, um, to, to, to sort of give his account or to, to file his report Basically, he was driving down the same interstate, uh, 77, I believe, and mm. he was flagged down by a man who was standing on the side of the road. Um, but this guy didn't stop. So he's approaching a man on the side of the road. He doesn't recall seeing a spaceship, but just the, the guy on the side of the road. Yeah. He, he too was sort of looking quite ominous, you know, was, you know, sort of flagged him, flagged him down. Now, whether that was, you know, physically kind of, you know, waving his arms to get him to stop, or whether that was telepathically, you know, asking him. Yeah. To stop. I, I don't, don't quite know. I don't think he confirms that. But the the guy basically just says that he was too scared to stop, 
and just carried on driving. Um, but it was the next day, I believe, that they confirmed it after Derenberger went on his local uh, TV station to give his interview. Um, that's when the police then was able to sort of almost corroborate the story to an extent because they came forward and said, well, actually, on that same night or on following night, you know, over various nights since, yeah, we've had various accounts of different... But sizes. also part of, part of it was also verified as well by because um, vehicles had passed them whilst they were having this conversation, Darren Berger and yes. Cole. Um, yeah. And people later on said, yeah, I remember seeing your red van, your red truck, because yeah. uh, they still call vans trucks yeah. out there. Um, it was a red panel truck, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing that vehicle on the side of the road with someone standing passenger on side, passenger side, yeah, looking like they were talking. Yeah. Um, so even then, that's then corroborated by other people that have seen that part of it. They said they didn't see any spaceship or anything like that, but... no. If you're if it's like 100 feet up in the air, no street lighting, no, and presumably just its lights would have been turned off. Cars. That's it, yeah. If it's char- charcoal gray, you're not really yeah. gonna see it, no lights at all. It's gonna so make yes, it very it's, difficult, it's, you know, it's deliberately gonna, you know, sort of blend in, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the main that is pretty much the main, um, sort of encounter, isn't it? From uh, Woodrow yeah. Derenberger, uh, which is the we most say, famous was, one. Yeah, like yeah, which, which was about two or three months after the uh, New Jersey um, encounter by the, the two two young guys. Now, the thing that kind of, and this is sort of moving on into to the sort of the aftermath of of Derenberger's encounter, but the thing that sort of resonated with me, and I'm not sure you know what you thought, Scott, but the fact that there were so many people that you know, that jumped on this, you know, in terms of wanting to know more about the encounter and, and seemingly believe in it. I mean, this was, I, can't, I haven't got the exact year in front of me, which is annoying, but I'm pretty sure this was about 20 years or so after Roswell. So Roswell was, I believe, 47. 47, yeah. So, yeah, it was, yeah, roughly, yeah, yeah 30. Roughly 20 years, years after that, yeah. Uh, sorry, 20, yeah, 20 years after. Um, mm. And so, that, you know, like we've, you know the Bigfoot thing. You know, once there's that first story or that that first sort of reported sighting, you're then going to expect expect the floodgates to open. Same thing with Roswell. Mm. You know, people are going to start seeing flying saucers. People are going to start, you know, going to New Mexico and 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 seemingly yeah. wanting to find something. So you would expect there to be a lot of stories. But there seemed to be something that resonated with a lot of people about Derenberger's account because, you know, as you refer to um, earlier, local. Um, uh, TV show or a TV company, sorry, mm. uh, called him and wanted him to come in for an interview on TV to go over his account. Um, yeah. Again, we'll put a link up to it on on one of the the socials because it's definitely worth uh, it's definitely worth uh, listening to um, for sure. It's um, it's it's you know it's intriguing and, and you know think what you want of the account, but you know based on what we've you know sort of told you, but. Derenberger doesn't come across as a guy who's who's lying. No. Which I think is what captivated a lot of people. And the two guys that are interviewing him are seemingly it's not trying weird. to catch him out, but they're trying to they're, they're trying to see whether there's a, a you know they're a different explanation. A deeper, aren't they? they're, they're trying yeah. to dig into you know him as a person, you know, I think because I think they even ask him, is he a drinker? You know, to yeah. which he sort of laughs and says, you know no i can't remember his exact wording but no. he basically in a word says no you know i'm not it, it know, says he doesn't believe in drinking that's, doesn't believe um, in i remember it, that's that right. part. unfortunately later on in life because of everything that happens to him he does become he does a turn to the drink yeah he does turn to the drink to cope with everything that's happened to him the, the, kind um, of the, the fallout but yeah so he has the sorry go on. definitely it's definitely worth listening to that interview it's only 30 mm. minutes um, yeah. unfortunately the whole thing isn't available because they they continued to question him for another two, two hours, hours after this yeah. um and they go over the story again and again and again but it's just this one live interview it's about mm. 30 minutes long and it's really worth listening to it and hearing the sincerity in in his voice yeah um like which, you do uh, believe him you do believe yeah. him like because i mean we've we've watched a lot of documentaries you know like i say about <laughs> you know 
Bigfoot, Bigfoot. And, you know we've seen you know and anyone who's watched you know unexplained or you know UFO shows on on TV plenty you of know, them you can listen to people and you you can tell by either the story or how they're recounting it that they're lying or they're fabricating the story as they go along mm. but there's something almost unnerving about Derenberger in his delivery of his story because it's just very calm it's very matter, matter of fact, fact. Mm. and it, and and yeah, and, and that for me, I was just, you know, Injured Cold as a character fascinated me from when I very first sort of heard about it. Um, but then you actually listen to his in- encounter, and I was probably more fascinated with Derenberger and how he just was so sure that what ha- that his account happened, you know. Mm. And he didn't come across as the sort of guy that would be clever enough, you know, and this is meant with the greatest respect, you know, but he, he wasn't... It didn't come across as clever enough to fabricate such a story, um, you know. And the, the, the interviewers mm. tried to catch him out, you know. As I say, they they try to sort of throw questions at him to, you know, as you say, dive deeper into it and be like, well, you know, could it have just been this, or, or you know, how did this happen? And well, what did they say to you? How did you know he was talking telepathically? And every time, without you know, without hesitation, Derenberger had a response. Mm. But it didn't feel like a scripted response. Like he knew what they were going to ask him, and he had a pre, a preempted, you know, answer. It was just, yeah, it was Absolutely. just matter of fact. It was just, you know, this. The is one thing what that I would be happened. interested in seeing is the actual video of that interview, because um, the only I've only ever been able to find the audio, which is good enough to listen to. Yeah. But I would like to see the, um, I'd like to see the video of it to mm. see, because obviously we all have little tells. Little tells that we do, like um, if, if you know it, like a basic psychology, you know when someone's lying, they yeah. look off to the left and or down, down they're the trying floor. to imagine something. Or if someone's looking off into the distance as they're recalling it, they're visualizing mm. it. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see whether or not he's looking down to the left or if he's looking off into the distance and in or looking at visualizing them in the eye, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, even then, as well, it, it, there's too much eye contact. Mm. It's, 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 it's that's also a bit of a tell yeah. as to whether or not someone's lying. Because no, I am telling you the truth, definitely, yeah. right in your eyes, it's the truth. Um, but even just from the audio, you, you can you can feel quite assured that. I mean, whether you want to believe that it, it happened, you know, is entirely up to you know, we'll see mm. us and you know, and and sort of the listeners. Um, and yeah, and, and and you know, make up your own mind. But Derenberger believes that it happened. You know, it yeah. was true. Oh, it, it was real to him. It was you know, it was true to him at that time. Um, and I think that's what obviously led the police, you know, to believe him and actually take his account, you know, for real and actually add some sort of credibility to it. Then you've got the the TV station, who you know, of course, they want to sort of get something that's going to pull in views. You know, get the local quirk on sensationalism. To, you know, yeah. yeah, exactly. But they don't seem overly unconvinced by him. I think they almost believe him as well. Certainly towards the end of the interview, they start to sort of come round to the fact that okay, this guy certainly believes that what mm. he's telling us, you know, is true. And I think that's, I think that's fine, kind of further corroborated by the fact that NASA, um, you know also get involved um, yes, they do. by and you know and for me you know if he was a crackpot or people thought he was nonsense or you know here we go you know another guy looking for his five minutes of fame with a fabricated yeah. story then why would nasa specifically get in contact with him and not only mm. that but invite him down to uh florida yeah, to, down um, to Cape Canaveral. That's it. I was trying to think of the bloody name of it. Yeah, well done. <laughs> to Cape Canaveral. <laughs> I've um, been there. <laughs> to actually, uh, you have, yes. I have. Um, to, you know, to actually, you know, interview him, you know, get his account. I think they were they were wanting to talk to him not more about his encounter because, you know, you'd have to just listen to the interview to get everything that you needed to know. Yeah. But they were asking him questions more about the um, the actual travel aspect so you know where yeah. it you know where he'd gone to uh where injured cold had sort of come from where he'd gone to you know how you know did he find anything out about you know where he was from you know did it have a mm. name did it have a location this kind of thing so it was more about the space element as opposed to 
the encounter, which yeah, which I think it's worth it's worth adding at this point. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail about it later, but yeah, we will. Um, yeah. He does. He Derenberger does actually travel with Cold he to does. Cold's home planet, mm, and it does. was after this this actually happened. That's when NASA got involved and was asking him all those questions of like, well, yeah. How does the ship work? How does uh, the, yeah, asking yeah. about the propulsion system and everything else yeah. like that? The light, um, the, the travels in in uh, sorry the, the the distance in light years and mm. so it was more about that kind of thing that NASA specifically wanted to you know because wasn't to, uh, wasn't it um, wasn't it the ex police chief from Parkersburg? Um, I think his name was Parler. Mm. He was also head of security at NASA. Well, it's it was it, that was sort of his title, and that's mm. when he got in contact on behalf of NASA. He got in contact with Derenberger because yeah. he'd already met him previously. That's right. And that's when he arranged the meeting with Derenberger and a man who called himself just Charlie yeah. and said that he was head of NASA. That's right. Um, yeah. Which in itself is a bit shady because yeah, just give your name. Yeah. You know, if it's something that's official, if you're not looking to... You know, if it's genuine, yeah, or, and you're just yeah. looking to ask some questions and find a little bit out, even if you're just humouring the guy, you know, what's mm. the harm in giving your name, your title? You know, why go under, a, you know, what's presumably an alias if you're only mm. if you're only given a first name, you know? But what's what, stranger we... about that as well is that he... Darren Berger says that he got the impression that those at NASA were just confirming... Yeah, the they details of it. Yeah, but they so already, they already knew, knew about it. Yeah, so they already like, knew. he already knew about this planet, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, th that they already knew about it. They knew that... the distance. They knew that it was part of the Ganymede system, I believe, or a, well, this or is... a galaxy of systems near Ganymede. Well, this this that's where it's that's where the 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 details kind of start falling apart because Ganymede is actually a moon of Jupiter. Mm. It's there's also no galaxy within. 14 and a half light years distance from yeah, us. Which is the you know, distance the, that Derenberger said to NASA, wasn't it? Yeah, the closest that's about is um, is Andromeda. And yeah, I, I believe you're saying, actually, yeah. It's, um, which isn't even that it's, far, it's, is it? It's 2.5 million light years away. Yeah. So and this is something about 15, light years so, as well. People don't really yeah. realise it's not a... It's not a um, it's not a measurement of time, it's a measurement of distance. So it's how long it takes for that light to travel yeah. to here. So Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. So the time it is, takes two point five yeah. million years for that light to get here. So if if and that's our closest galaxy. So yeah. part of me is thinking that maybe Indra Cold later tells him this information to say that yeah. it's you know, it's a planet of Lanulos. It's very much like Earth. It's located in the galaxy of Ganymede. Mm. Maybe that's what they call it. Yeah, maybe they've maybe they've got their own galaxy called Ganymede. And maybe. Maybe, maybe they measure maybe light light years is different a different measurement. measurement for them. Yeah. Or or possibly did he give this to Derenberger to throw him off the scent? It's you know, so he didn't give the real lo location away. I, mean, I, I know he said that like the the humans and the powers that be, the ones that these it's a kind of hairless no Hellas chimps with nuclear weapons knowing where <laughs> I live, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I wouldn't want it either. No, absolutely. Like, I mean, I know Cold got a ghost say to, to <laughs> well, exactly. I know, yeah, exactly. I know Derenberger, uh, sorry, Cold does say to Derenberger that he will come back and later corroborate his story, but maybe he wasn't ready to do it at that point, which is why he mm. maybe drops in these red herrings. But then, but then all that information wasn't debunked by NASA because, you know, as you rightly said, they. They were receiving the information as though they already knew it. They just yeah. wanted to see what Derenberger knew to maybe assess whether he was a threat or, you know, whether whether he needed to be sort of debriefed into, you know, maybe not communicating this information and, you know, and kind of giving it all, giving it all away because his family were invited down to Florida for a week. So he was yeah. put through polygraphs. He was put through, I think, head scans and CT scans mm. and, you know, all this other stuff, which, which, from what he says, he passed with flying colours because they wanted mm. to look for um, uh, symptoms of like epilepsy to see whether that affected his right. brain function, and that's what created this whole, you know, kind of story. There was all these mm. kind of tests and interviews that he had, and yeah, as you say, he was kind of put at ease that they were asking him, yeah, as though they already knew, as though mm. they 
they just wanted to find out what Derenberger knew. Uh, and I think that kind of, I think that kind of leads quite nicely into another interaction um, or encounter that, that Derenberger claims to have had, which was, is with the infamous Men in Black. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was it was after the Florida visit, but it was quite shortly after that mm. he, yeah, that a, a plane, you know, a plane, you know, vehicle uh, pulls up on the the drive of his, you know, his black property. vehicle as well, black vehicle as well, you know, yeah. un, unmarked, I think, you know, pulls up onto you know his property, um, you know, two gentlemen, you know, get out. And, and sort of suits. speak to him in black suits, of course, um, uh, which which I think is is the only description that Derenberger gives. He doesn't go into, you know, whether they, you know, like injured cold, were you know, mm. tanned complexion, slick back hair, or or anything like that. He, so it wasn't presumed a, a, that they were just humans. So it wasn't a, just. So it wasn't like a, a tall, good-looking black guy with funny ears. And yeah. a, a slightly shorter, <laughs> wrinkly-faced man. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't Will Smith or Tommy Lee Jones. Oh was, no. Okay. Yeah. It, that's it was, what I was getting at. <laughs> fairly. Yeah. Fairly nondescript. All that. All he seems to mention from from what I can remember. And you know, if anyone's listening, you know, mm. please correct me if I'm wrong. But the only thing that he mentioned was that the vehicle was black and unmarked, and that mm. they were just two fairly nondescript gentlemen. In, in black suits and they had yeah. a fairly I think the conversation started fairly amicable you know it's fairly polite they you know they introduced themselves as as being from the government didn't give yeah. any you know code names you know like J or K or, <laughs> or anything, anything like <laughs> didn't that didn't give any initials <laughs> no initials no names just that they were from a branch of the government and that they were there to talk to him about his recent encounter um I think once the pleasantries had been, you know, sort of gotten out of the way, um, that was, I think, pretty much the extent of it until uh, towards the end of the conversation where they quite matter of fact said to Derenberger, um, you've, you've got to stop talking about injured cold, mm. you know, stop talking about your encounter, stop telling people about what was said to you and, and all of this stuff. Um, I think so, otherwise we can't protect you or something yeah, like right. that. So it was quite, yeah. um, it was, it was, it was obviously quite a, you know, threatening, you know, warning, you know, yeah. to which Derenberger said, well, no, I, I can't, you know, I can't do that. Um, I think he says in his book that he, he told the, the, the gentleman, these, you know, these men in black that he would continue telling his story about the encounter until injured cold, and other Lanulosians come back to Earth and Definitely. confirmed their presence and told their own story. He said, until yeah. that day, I'm going to continue speaking for them um, and try and, because what he wanted to do was try and make Earth a more welcoming place because he was scared yeah. that if the Lanulosians did return to Earth, that they would be met with hostility um, yeah. and, which, and violence. Which, um, that's exactly what Cold go he does actually say to Derenberger. He says, you mm. know, we've, we've been shot at. Mm. You, you know, our ships have been shot at. We've been shot at. Even Lanulosians have been killed when yeah. they're approaching people. Which, yeah, which is going to be harrowing for any any sort of species of or, or group of people, whether you're from mm. this planet or not. If you're constantly met with violence and, and gunfire, then that's obviously going to it's well, going to make you feel somewhat reluctant. To, well, that's you know, why we don't go known. to Sentinel Island, isn't it? Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, they, that's they, why there are certain islands in the what in the in the Amazon or the Pacific or something where humans, mm, well, you, Westerners specifically don't go to because they they are captured and eaten. killed <laughs> and eaten. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's very much the same kind of warning, you know, to them, and that kind of ties into a lot of the accounts from Derenberger and his daughter Tonya um, regarding groups of people, but basically flocking to their property um, with rifles. Hiding in the yeah. trees, hiding in the bushes, you know, skulking around Derenberger's property in the hope mm. that they catch a, a a sight of you know injured cold or you know other Lanulosians to, and to ironically, basically shoot them. It's ironically, it seems like they did many times. And yeah, they actually but, did many times. They actually walked amongst the the locals with the rifles, but because they're so much like us, they were able to 
you know, kind of blend in. I think if, if the only distinguishing feature was that they were, you know, quite tanned, you know, you're not necessarily mm. going to point that out as a, as a thing to be kind of skeptical of. So they, yeah, seemingly were able to kind of blend in, um, unnoticed basically. Um, yeah. but no, I mean, we, you know, so with the, you know, with the, the TV station, the local police, you know, you've got NASA now you've, you know, supposedly or reportedly got the men in black coming to t- talking to Darren mm. This to me, and again, believe in all of this, what you will adds credibility and depth to his story. You know, why would these government officials bother harassing him if he was just a local kook who was just, you know, was just making it up. And I, I think Absolutely. it says a lot about Darren character. You know, when you, you look at pictures of him, you know, you watch him in the interview or you listen to him in the interview. He doesn't come across as a guy who's trying to get his five minutes of fame. Like he didn't approach the TV station. They approached him. Yeah. You know, the story only came about because his wife called the police because she was generally concerned that something had happened to her husband, you know. Absolutely. And and so, you know, if he was, you know, if it was in the times of social media and he was jumping on Facebook or he was phoning around to newspapers and to production companies and all of that, pushing really his story. Promote his story. Then you'd be like, yeah. okay, this is just a guy who's, you know, but he mm. was, he was quite, a, you know, a, 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 when I say simple guy, and I'm not referring to his intelligence, but, you know, he didn't have, a, you know, a lot of, yeah. you know, material items you know he had a, a sort of a fairly basic job he worked in factories you know he was a door-to-door salesman mm-hmm. you know he's very much a family man thought of you know quite quite highly in, in the local well, sort of salt community. of the earth sort of fella. salt of the earth you know genuine yeah. genuine guy really mm. um and so you know as a character you know as a sort of a character you i suppose not only do you want to believe him but i think you find yourself believing him because of his character traits yeah absolutely very very gentle very kind of yeah very matter of fact very calming in how he delivers it now either he could be very Mm. clever and you know adapts his personality to make the story work you know or it's just genuine and i think you know he's got no reason to lie you know because he had a good job. He had a happy life at home, wife, kids, you know, did, good job, yeah. whatever else. So he had no reason to sacrifice all that to come out with this story. He was already, you know, he was already quite successful. Mm. You know, His life was, a, was ruined by this story, really. Exactly. Really yeah, and he had no reason to self um, sabotage himself. So, mm. but yeah, well, but like, I mean, like, like we'll I say, go into those, those. We'll go into yeah. that really once we, you know, when we decide to get off the fence with it, really. Yeah, yeah exactly, you know, we we'll go yeah. through all of those different aspects about it, you know, all the various theories and everything as to why yeah, exactly this but story is, might have come about. But was there anything else that you wanted? Because I know there was the NASA thing. There was the government slash mm. many well, black. One who thing approached I want to, him. want to mention about the NASA thing is he. he have agreed into it naively again going on about his his character he thought it was going to be like a week's holiday in florida really he did. that's what he thought he thought he was just going to get a little tour of around nasa he was going to be down there yeah. for a week um spend some time with the family in the nice weather um mm. and it, it no it was just constant tests um, tests questions constant questioning, interviews paragraph yeah. you know the, 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 the polygraph test as well yeah. it's um again Which he passed that, that with shows, colors Apparently, yeah. I think, which I think is worth noting, which but he is passed really it. Really hard to yeah. do. So, if he is lying, then he's managed to be one of the only people in existence to train himself to essentially go undetected mm. on a polygraph, which are ninety nine point something. From... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a sewing machine salesman from West Virginia, USA, has somehow managed to a genius. You know, yeah, fall a polygraph test, which is what ninety nine point nine something percent true or so so you know you kind of think well he's either convinced himself to such an extent that that happened that he's actually fabricated it as a genuine memory and the polygraph couldn't pick it up Mm. or it happened yeah you know and they're pretty much really they're pretty much the only two you know sort of you know scenarios with that um you know really but um i guess you know this could be another it might be worthwhile going on to his second encounter then which I was just going to say it could be, to a, be another segue um only a couple of days later yeah it was after the first encounter it was quite literally uh yeah a, a few a few days i believe um after the the first one um 
so so I don't think the the you know the NASA thing or you know the men in black or anything like that has happened just yet but um no, no we kind of got about it a bit back yeah, really a bit <laughs> sort of fast about face but um so we're going back in time of, now yeah exactly yeah um but I think this kind of adds credibility to it I think um because Derenberger, you know, reports that, you know, that Cold said to him in the first encounter, you know, we will meet again or, you know, we will see you again. Um, mm. And, you know, as you as you rightly mentioned, that, that, that indeed does happen. Um, this is, you know, a few few days um, after injured Cold does return to West Virginia. Now, Derenberger returns home late from from work. I think he was saying mm. about half ten uh, 11 o'clock at night I think he was saying which um, seems to be a regular sort of thing that would be part of his regular routine as he said that yeah. most of his sales would be in the evening post 5 o'clock because yes, he's yeah. selling sewing machines he's got to be well, people need to in the be homes in. where the people are there people need to so, be at home so then he needs to wait for people to return home mm. from their own jobs to make sure that when he knocks that there's someone going to be there so, yeah, so getting home at half 10, 11 o'clock was a yeah. regular sort of thing for him yeah, so it wasn't exactly. anything so it's not, out of the blue no, it's not out of the ordinary. So he says that he he pulls up onto his drive, situates the car down, you know, down the side of his house, and he opens his door to get out, and he just hears injured cold. So no no prior warning, nothing. He just hears injured cold say to him uh, something along the lines of, "Don't be afraid, Woody. It's injured, and I've brought my friend Cole with me." Um, yeah, Carl, wasn't it? Carl, yeah, Carl Ardo, as we later find Sorry. out, is his uh, is his name, um, and uh, yeah, so so he gets out of the he gets out of the car, and Indrid and Carl aren't standing next to the car. There aren't you know they're not really anywhere to be seen. It turns out they're waiting for him on Derenberger's back porch, so mm. seemingly out of sight and away from any sort of prying eyes. Because I think, as we were um, referred to earlier, a lot of the action from sort of local people was concentrated around the front of the property. That's right. Uh, they were hiding up in the tall trees and, and whatever else. So Derenberger basically walks around to the back of the house and meets injured cold and Cole Ardo on his, on his back porch. And they have a conversation which Derenberger says lasted about two hours, yeah. um, you know, something like that. And within that conversation, I think it was more so time for, injured cold to relay kind of his story so it wasn't so much about them asking questions to find out about earth it was more their opportunity to tell derenberger about their planet and you know yeah you know sort of where you know where they come from and as you know as you as you mentioned uh, mm-hmm. earlier that is a planet called lanulos mm-hmm. and they so they talk about Lanulos. They you know they. I don't think it's at this point that they tell him where it is. I think he finds that out later when he actually goes aboard the ship and, and actually travels there. I don't think he mentions mm. Ganymede until that point, which is much later on. Um, but yeah, they they talk about things like and, and referring back to human traits and, and human experiences. But they they mention things like you know they they don't understand the word hate. Yeah, you know, they're a they very, don't understand the concept of it. No, they're a very peaceful uh, sort of species or, or, or race. You know, they they don't understand our religions as a as a plural. That yeah. you know, on on their planet, they see all of themselves as children of God. So mm. they're all one of the same. You know, they, there's no segregation, no no sort of difference. So they have their one their one God they're all mm. children of that God. And so they all celebrate and, 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 and sort of worship the same thing. Yeah. So again, they, he made reference to not understanding why we had so many. Um, mm. Then there's, you know, there's the whole thing about being, you know, being peaceful. They don't get the context of, of hate, which then leads into the fact that they, they don't have wars. They don't have violence. Mm. They um, understand war either. No, they didn't, they didn't get the point. Yeah, why are you fighting one another? What have you? Why can't you just all get along? You know, so and they couldn't talk. understand the the 
um, that it's not just small groups of people like tribes fighting each other. It's whole countries, yeah, whole countries. that are fighting yeah. like, whole huge groups of people that are fighting yeah. other huge groups of people. Yeah. They couldn't even understand it on that sort of scale because no, um, that's right. I mean, it's also might be worth mentioning as well that in that first encounter, he says to Derenberger, I come from a place that's not as strong as here. Um, yeah, I don't think that's the word that. actually. He says, I come from a place that's weaker. Weaker. Weaker, yeah. which is a weird way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so they must already have a prior knowledge of, you know, of kind of how we work, you know, how we're set up. So it's mm. interesting that you wanted to know specifically about Parkersburg, um, you know, and, and that that surrounding area. Uh, so I don't know whether he, when he says that, you know, where I come from is weaker, did he mean weaker than Earth or did he mean weaker than the United States? Um can't quite remember whether he relates to that specifically but yeah it was thing yeah so it, it was things like that you know he says you know we we come from a, a sort of a weaker place they already had an idea of how we were you know kind of set up um mm. but yeah they they talk about you know their like their um their seasons and that he he mentions that they they have three seasons in in what i guess is their their kind of year but again i don't know how they they sort of measure that but it's basically the three seasons are planting harvest and then just cold which presumably cold. would be like winter Win yeah um they have they do have a language a lanulosian language but they mostly talk telepathically because they he he holds that as the main reason as to why they're such a peaceful race because they can tell what people are feeling they can tell what people are thinking. Mm. So any kind of animosity, any any kind of nonsense or any unnecessary action. It breaks down language broken barriers. Broken down, yeah. And there is no language barrier because there's nothing lost in translation because you can tell everything about someone yeah. before you've had said conversation. So, yeah. Which so is when you think language. about it, when you actually think about it, it makes sense. Because it does, yeah. I do a world scenario, which you, uh, which is, I think, a lot of what Lanulose is made up of. A lot of, mm. I think, it's what a lot of humans would want our world to be. You know, a lot, and I think it derives from a lot of the different religions. You know, a lot of the peaceful religions. Um, you know, they want our belief system and our way of life to basically be how injured cold tells us lanulose is like a utopia isn't it is really? a, yeah utopia absolutely no exactly right like a paradise of uh you know of sorts and it does make sense if, if you if you're willing to go down that kind of train of thought and you know think you know we could all live in harmony live as one you know don't worry about differences or you know all speak with one mind i guess mm. it does it, it you know it, it, it sort of does make sense now i, I don't know whether Derenberger was sounds a bit like communism to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, private joker. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it does though. I mean, it's, it does. No, it does. It, it's, it's... it does come across as like one of these, and it, you often hear that with regards to um, a lot of other contactee uh, stories um, and, and and accounts. It's that mm. they're being told that, like even even in like the first encounter where he says, we wish you nothing but happiness. Yeah. Um, which is quite a nice thing to say to someone. It, it's all about love. And yeah. there've been plenty of contactees that have written books, um, which yeah. you know, I've, I've read. And a lot of them do go on about, Oh, it's all about love. It's all about yeah. transcending into uh, yeah. being at peace with yourself, the universe and everything else. And that is, yeah. that's a movement that's happening at the moment. It is. And it yeah. was also a movement that was happening then in the 60s. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You know, the so is it all free love that? sort of thing. And well, that's I, mean, what I, I was going to say. I don't know like, if Woodrow was one of those sort of people. Well, I was just going to mention that the, the same sort of thing. Like, I didn't, I don't know whether he was religious himself, you know, based on, you know, where, you know, where and when he grew up. I'd be mm. surprised if he wasn't. So is all of, is Lanulose derived from, teachings of you know the bible mm. in terms of you know love love thy neighbor and you know everything you know shouldn't be judged and you know all of that all of that business so yeah so that, that's the only reason why i'd sort of be a little skeptical but uh, you know but what well, kind of feeds also... off... go on. So go on, go on. i was just say what, oh, what what kind of feeds off of that 
is the yeah. um, which which was the the funny kind of aspect of of what you know was experienced by Derenberger was that the Lanulosians could wear clothes but chose not to, which yeah. kind of fed into their very much kind of loving utopia. You know, they were essentially nudists for yeah. want of a better description. <laughs> Um, naked space commies naked space commies which i think was yeah <laughs> which i think was your perfect description um <laughs> you know sort of for them um so yeah so I'd, I'd, yeah i mean this is where i'd say to listen to um you know to anyone out there also you and i have listened to it for the purposes mm. of um of, of this today but to anyone else who wants to really dive deep into his experience and when he does eventually you know travel to lanulos with injured cold um, and Carlardo um, and another figure who they introduce uh, by the name Demo of Demo Hassan. Hassan. Yes. I see. Um, he's not out... a Lanulosan, apparently. No, he's not. No, he he's comes from, from a, another... Cerebus. Yeah. A, a sort of a, presumably a neighboring planet. Cause they go into like a galactic alliance sort of thing. Like there's a, they there's do, a circle yeah. of races that it's like a galactic. Well, they do. Senate. And, well, they, well, because there are searchers, you know, which is what Injured Cold's title is, but there were searchers from other galaxies or other planets mm. who seemingly come to Earth for the same purpose. Because when, I mean, I mean, this second encounter, they do offer Derenberger to go onto the ship and mm. they'll take him to Lanulos. But on this occasion, he, he declines. Yeah, yeah which... Yeah. If, if that's not true, then it's very clever because it gives me that extra kind of cr- bit of credibility because if he w- if this was made up, then instantly he would have been like, you know, as promised, Injured yeah. Cold came back, he invited me on this wicked spaceship and we went flying mm. off to his home planet. But the fact that... I've read, I've read plenty of accounts plenty that have of that been like, like that. that. Yeah. Go, and, and they approached me and off I went into their spaceship yeah. with no fear whatsoever. And Exactly. But he... Yeah. He steps foot on the ship and because he, he, he says that he thinks to himself, oh, God, they're going to they're take me away even though I don't want to. And he comments on the fact that Injured Cold laughs and says, no, Woody, not if you don't want to. Mm. And then Derenberger feels stupid for thinking That's right, because the, the door closes. That's it, the door closes. Because he touches the little panel thing on the side and the door closes. He touches the goes, panel. Oh, my God, they're going to take me. The door closes and he's like, oh, God, they're going to take me even though I don't want to. Yeah, Injured well, cold laughs the door close <laughs> and says, "No, Woody, like we're not going to take you, not if you don't want to." And then he forgets that obviously Injured Cold can read his thoughts, so now he feels mm. stupid, and and he says, "Well, why did you close the door?" And he and Injured Cold says, "I didn't. You did." <laughs> and then when he sort of looks around, he notices that he he sort of brushed his hand on on a on a, on a panel, a glowing blue panel, to the side of him, and then when mm. he runs his hand over it again. As expected, yeah, the, the door. door opens, and that's what, how he's able to get off the craft. And he obviously declines the the visit to um, to Lanulos. But a quick quick story, which I thought was quite intriguing, is that when he th- does go to Lanulos, he does actually meet a couple from Earth. That's right. Uh, there are about, about that fifty. Bit. There are fifty year old couple apparently. Um, and w- when he's walking around Lanulos being introduced to the various elements by injured mm. cold, they he meets them, and I think he says that he only starts talking to them because he recognizes how they look and that they are different to the other Lanulosians. And it's when mm. they confirmed that they were of Earth and they were brought to Lanulos and they were asked or they were told that if they wanted to, they could stay here. Yeah, they you know, they had no tires on earth or no reason to kind of stay there they really loved where they were so they chose to they chose to stay they were given a a place to live they were given a job and a responsibility and they seemingly were able to make a a life for themselves oh that was it sorry they were playing (laughs) they were playing uh, an intergalactic version of badminton and they walked past them as they were playing and it was during the conversation that the gentleman out of the couple actually confirmed that they were well into their 90s or should That's be right. well into their 90s if they were on Earth. But there was something about Lanulos that kind of almost preserved them. Mm. And, uh, because uh, Derenberg commented on the fact that they were, you know, playing this badminton type game, but seemingly fit as a fiddle, but looked 
but physically looked old, but didn't portray themselves as they were that age. It's almost like their their inner body was far younger mm. than what their external sort of physique yeah. and body allow, would allow you to think. Um, well, that might come down to, I mean, we even have this sort of things now with exercise and, and good eating, you know, good yeah. natural eating no, will do eat that. Right, you know, you right see some of the people and... that the, the, the comparison pictures of someone in their seventies, like a, there's a, a female yes. bodybuilder that's in her seventies. She looks that's phenomenal. Right. She looks incredible. She's in her seventies. I like that. Is incredible. I can't ridiculous. think of what her name is, but no, I, I can't. I saw I know it this exactly morning. In fact, yeah. I saw it ripped. this morning. <laughs> like she is, and that's living on Earth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So imagine what you know what space travel would uh, mm. would do to you. But also, yeah, but yeah, we, we digress. But if, if yeah. you want to um, deep dive into that, then check out um, visitors from Lanulos. Um, I well, we both listened to the audio book. Um, mm. it's, it's Woodrow Derenberger's book. So it, it's, it's an account of everything from, from start to finish of when he first meets Indrid, you know, to the media aftermath. So the visit to Florida and, you know, mm. all of that stuff. So that, you know, the men in black encounter, the second encounter that obviously I've just, you know, sort of gone over, but it go, it, it deep dives into that conversation. Obviously I've glossed over it, you know, quite yeah. quickly because otherwise we could easily be here for two hours just talking about that discussion about <laughs> how lanulose Indeed. works how the government there works um you know uh, and so and I, and I think it'd be good for people to listen to it you know kind of for themselves uh and so check you know check that out um, it'll be it'll be in, it'll be good to note as well that um the guy that um not necessarily co-authored it because it wasn't just woody um derenberg's book he wasn't the only one to write on it he also had someone um harold w hubbard um yes help produce the book that's right um the book came out in 1971 and yep. um it was basically it's basically like a, a self-publication no distribution or anything like that yeah. so almost like self-published wasn't it like indie. yeah derenberger had to buy the copies that he was looking to sell so yeah. at one point there was only six copies in existence um, of That's this right. book and apparently Hubbard who um, edited the book as well left out a, a lot of information um, and that inf that information actually comes from um, John Keel John Keel says that once he got to actually know Derenberg and anyone let's first go through that actually anyone that has looked into UFOs or anything paranormal will know the name of John Keel um, and you know exactly, his yeah. credentials and you know exactly what he's capable of doing. Um, yeah. So he, had, he got to know Derenberger really, really well. That's right. And what might be a good question is what information did Hubbard leave out of the book? Exactly. Yeah, and he according to Keel, before he passed, mm. um, was a lot of information. And also it might be worth asking how much influence did Hubbard have over the production of the book? So if Woody maybe might have been a, a bit lot more... Of it. I think if Woody had been a bit more stern and a bit more uh, kind of forthcoming with what he wanted the book to be like, yeah. then I think it would have been very different to how it turned out. But because Hubbard took it upon himself to say, I, you know, I believe in you, I believe your story, I'm going to take this on and publish it, he kind of took creative license as to what was going to be, you know, kind of included. Um, mm. And so there's probably, I mean, even his, um, Derenberger's daughter, Tonya, who did bring out her own book subsequently um, called Beyond Lanulos, she comments mm. on the fact that she even now is still finding little snippets of information from her dad's original manuscript that she didn't know because yeah. Hubbard left it out of the original, you know, the original And she book. hasn't even got the full manuscript either. She hasn't got the full Not manuscript. Yet. No, she said she found a shoebox after her dad passed that had some scribbles that were basically the beginnings of, you know, his original, um, you know, his original sort of manuscript. But, but yeah, we've got those, there's the yeah, visitors from Lanulos and beyond Lanulos, both of the audio books that I, you know, we'd both suggest people kind mm -hmm. of check out to get a little bit more on, you know, the ins and outs of, especially the second encounter. I think we covered the, the initial one quite well, but there's certainly yeah. the second one. If you want to learn about, you know, sort of lanulose, but um, yeah, I think um, I think we've covered everything that would probably 
that I think everyone would probably need to know. So I think now mm. I think we should probably, I guess, go into what our thoughts are, whether we believe it and why, and and what we sort of what weight we kind of want to add to it. So did you yeah. want to kick it off, or did you have anything else you wanted to lead with first? Um, no, no, I think it's worthwhile us actually getting off the fence a bit. I mean, I the, think I think so. obviously yeah. the biggest question that we've got to ask, number one mm. question is, is this true? Yeah. Like, is yeah. it true? Did, sure. did this, I believe, I believe like what you said earlier, that I believe Darren Berger believed it was true. Yes. I be, you know, it's, he comes across as incredibly, incredibly genuine. Yes. Um, he comes across as, uh, I try to put my thoughts into words. I think he's, the fact that this story ruined his life. Um, yeah, mm. it, it should it should be telling enough that he's he wasn't looking to get any sort of fifteen minutes of fame. He, didn't he wasn't need looking it. to no. no, he didn't need it. He was very from good what happened, absolutely a happy it, home life, wife, kids. Yeah, you know, that typical kind of I get you know as as it's West Virginia that American dream, you know type you know scenario. So he didn't need to put himself in that position where he was going to seemingly ruin his life. Yeah. Well, he's, he ended right up being states, divorced yeah. from his from his wife, and because she couldn't handle it anymore, she was no. incredibly scared. Even her account, she was very, very scared of these people that were coming yeah. to visit um, Woody she all the time. Yeah, she didn't trust them quite as much as uh, Woody did. Yeah, it's um, it's from what I can tell, and I want to take everything into account on this as well, it, yeah. especially John Kills, because uh, even. Even John Keel had an encounter there as well. He saw lights. He saw, um, he saw sh- uh, one of the ships, didn't he? Or a series of the ships. That's right. And which he went running out into the field. This was... Um, he recounts cl- seeing it from Derenberger's back garden. That's right. He runs Yeah, because he, the, he was fence. in the area. He was yeah. in the area investigating right. other things other that accounts, were happening yeah. in the area. Um, and that might be something worthwhile mentioning. In the yeah, tri-state definitely. area, there was a huge UFO flap. Yes, there now, was. Anyone, uh, that, anyone that's not clued up on what that means, a, a, a UFO flap is something that happens where all of a sudden there's hundreds of UFO sightings. Mm. And then, it was like a break in, in the atmosphere or, you know, the, 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 the sort of a, a, a portal or an opening or, or something that, mm. that basically creates or, or yeah sort of creates this reason for you know ufos to you know be seen and not just by you know one person but by a number of different people which has led people to believe you know how the whole injured cold encounter occurred and yeah. all of the subsequent um you know sightings um you know that that, that happened in and around you know that, that sort West of Virginia time. and and, yeah, exactly. and Ohio and Kentucky Pleasant, as well. I think Point Pleasant yes, is a big hot Point spot. Pleasant comes up a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's um, when we was talking about the the Lily family. That's in fact where they that's they right. lived. They that's was in Point Pleasant, where yeah. unfortunately the young, the youngest daughter had someone in her room, a smiling man yeah. standing there in her in her yeah. room. And I mean, the one thing that I will say about this as well is that. The name Indrid Cold, the first time I ever heard about it was um, on the Mothman Prophecies, the film that came out in yeah, 2002. Exactly, which is probably worth mentioning, was was written by John Kill, John Kill who showed yeah. an invested interest in Derenberger and his Indrid Cold um, story because the encounters of both Mothman and, and Cold were in and around the same area of Point Pleasant, Parkersburg, and you know, those parts of you know west west virginia and obviously for anyone who's seen the film there is a sort of a name drop uh, or a, cert- a section of the film which involves um Indrid cold. Indrid cold he's yeah. quite a prominent figure in the film which yeah. um obviously they took a lot of artistic license with it and even john keel later on said that he wasn't 100 percent happy with how the film turned out no. in that respect because even no. even um the guy that's in the guy that plays, I can't remember what his character is, but his name, uh, the actor's name is Will. And he plays a gentleman that has an encounter with Cold. And that guy is loosely yeah. based off of... Derenberger. 
Woody Ehrenberger. But he's portrayed um, to be more of a madman, isn't he, in, in the film, more of a sort of local crazy and, you know, people in the town don't really believe him, think he's a bit of a kook. And, yeah. and so, and even Tonya Derenberger, uh, Woodrow's daughter, she doesn't even like how her father is portrayed in the film, although it's not a no. direct representation of Woody. It's a character reference. Mm. Oh, go. His, his character name, Gordon Smallwood. There you go. Yeah. Gordon Smallwood. Gordon yeah. Smallwood, um, played by Will Patton. Yeah. Um, Will Patton, yeah. I mean, the, the one thing that I will always say is every every time I do watch the Mothman prophecies, it's that scene where um, John Klein, the character who's based off yeah. of John Keel, Richard, Richard, Gere um, Richard Gere's character, yeah, that's right. is in the motel and he's on the phone yeah. to Indrid Cold. It's possibly the creepiest part of the film, I think, for me. It's the one that stuck yeah. with me, and I, I know it did you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's that... And I want to take into account the the, the other encounters. So I want to take into account mm. the, the one from um, New Jersey. Yeah. And I want, to, want people to start thinking about it, because there's a line in the film mm. where John Klein asks Indra Cold over the phone, what do yeah. you look like? And... He says it depends on who's looking. Yeah. Now, which is creepy as, as hell. Which is really anyway. creepy. As you say, <laughs> that put the nicely. shivers up, mate. Oh, I did. But it, it, as you say, it ties in nicely to all the different encounters because people could say, well, you know, there's a hole in people's story. You mm. know, one person says that they look like this, one person says they look like that. Um, and it also kind of loosely, I think, ties into what we were discussing previously about the Bigfoot. Stuff yes. and about how we portray that species or that creature. Um, you know, the, the two boys in, in New Jersey refer to him as being quite sinister looking, you know, tall, mm. bald, featureless, with just a big grin. Um, then you've got uh, Linda Lilly, who you referenced uh, earlier. Again, she recalled seeing a big, tall, broad-shouldered figure with a big grin plastered on his face just yeah. standing over her bed, didn't say anything, didn't interact with her telepathically or otherwise, you know, just stood over her bed. Being a young girl, she was petrified. She hid under her covers. She popped her head back out and, you know, and it was, disappeared. It was gone. You know, then you've got Woodrow Derenberger's, you know, quite specific a- a- account. Very of, detailed uh, account. Very detailed account of what Indrid Cold looked like, you know, and, and Carlardo, Dimo Hassan. And they all had that stereotypical kind of, you know, from what he says, quite handsome features, mm. slick back hair, you know, dark complexion, you know, and so they're all very, very different in ways, but also very similar in others, you know, in, in mm. terms of the, the portrayal of how they each look. And and I think that line in the film is very clever in kind of tying them all in, you know, to, Absolutely. to, to, to kind of... Because it's relevance. the idea, I mean, the more we've looked in, and the reason why we're, I think the reason why we're really looking at Indrid Cold in that he's because some people might even argue he's not even a cryptid because when you think of cryptids, you think of Bigfoot, you think of werewolf, like El Chupacabra and, and all that sort yeah, of thing. Exactly. And, yeah. But more I think, mythical. I think the reason why we're looking at this is because where we've looked at stuff previously, we've got, I think we've each come up with our own ideas as to what it all is. And yeah. this seems to tie into that. And, it's linked. I mean, even, yeah, there's Bigfoot it's certain aspects and injured cold, it. certain aspects in terms of their existence, their sightings and the interactions that people have, you know, that they are, they are linked, you know, mostly because they're both creatures, you know, by the definition of sort of cryptid, they're both creatures who can't be explained. Yeah. They can't be, you know, they can't be proven. And I think that the intriguing thing for me with injury cold is that, he hasn't had hundreds and hundreds of sightings or, or interactions. You know, it's almost like they're very specific or very choosy as to who they interact with and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and who they pick. I think there's quite, you know, there's quite big I reasons, don't... I think, as to why they picked Derenberger yeah. and why they continue to talk with him. And, you know, there's that trust there. There was that, that safety, I think, from both parties. Um, you know, I suppose this is where I can get off the fence a little bit and... Mm. And kind of just say that I, I believe, I believe it for the most part. I think Derenberger believes wholeheartedly that he had that encounter, that he met a being 
whose name was Indrid Cold, and that they yeah. had this kind of, you know, these communications and, you know, the government, of, you know, the government got involved, whether it be the men in black or the CIA, whoever, you know, he did go to NASA, he had these polygraph tests, I think he even went to a local hospital to have blood works and stuff done because they were looking That's for right. tumours and, you know, and other things. So I, I believe... <laughs> and, and pregnancy. And pregnancy as well, which <laughs> someone did think, yeah. <laughs> Um, which is just brilliant. Yeah, for, any, for anyone that doesn't know, it's worth it's worth even. That's why it's worth checking out well. the audio book. Yeah, Someone or buying the book and reading it. But yeah, there's a rumor going around that in Lanulos they do things the opposite to us, and men yeah, get pregnant. The men that carry the babies. And, and someone even asked him once. They what? They asked Derenberger, "Are you pregnant? How are they going to get the baby out?" And he just played along with it. He did. Well, I think it's just well, unfortunate that he was quite a portly <laughs> gentleman, so he, he had quite a <laughs> quite a belly on him, and I think rumor just started that way really yeah um, I mean, everyone jokes about it it's like oh so when's it due when's it due then yeah yeah, like, yeah fuck off yeah, but this rumor like... actually did start where people started putting two and two together and making up their own sort of theories and that's what i liked people did do that locals and people that had read his account did make up their own theories as to what lanulose was what injured cold was how they lived and how they worked but Which seemingly goes to show you the impact that it had just exactly. on that local area but Derenberger didn't really swerve from his account or what he believes Cold told him or what he was shown. It's all very matter of fact and it's all very, yeah. you know, this happened. And that's why, I, I mean, certainly in recent years, and you'll attest to this, I've, you know, I've been more open-minded to believing in this type of thing. And there's a part of me that wants to believe it. Oh, definitely. It's, it's a and very, a very part attractive of me, part of it. There's a part of me that does believe it in terms of the initial encounter, I think parts of the story do unravel for me. I think if you listen to his daughter's accounts and when she starts going into detail about, you know, meeting injured Cold's children and, and all this mm -hmm. stuff, that's where I think for me, the the thread starts to run a bit, you know, a bit thin. Um, I would like I to expand on that though. I'd like to expand yeah. on that because um, uh, it's, it's something that's uh, become a, a development within the injured Cold story. And, it was is to do with um, Greg and Dana New, Newkirk, who did the Hellier series. Now, again, they're in the that that area of um, of the country, and Indrid Cold comes up in their own investigation into Hellier, Kentucky. I was just going to so say they, they're Kentucky, but I don't know the geography of it. But I think they're the same. I don't think state, it's, so I don't think it's it. too far. I don't no. think it's too far from that area. But no. um, basically, with their investigation, it seems like they managed to decode and find out where Indrid Cold lived. So right, okay. he also he also lived on Earth as well. Um, they later on go and see Tanya Derenberger Bowman. Um, in her care home because unfortunately she's um she's suffering with ms ms yeah needs 24 hour she care deteriorated quite sort of badly didn't she and she and because of her beliefs mm. in the injured cold story that she fell out with her her children yeah, fam her family's yeah, really awesome family yeah they've really sort of separated themselves from her because of how adamant she is that this you know that this all, all happened but um mm. Which again, that can yeah. you could probably attest that. I mean, you could probably take that into account into whether or not she's telling the truth, because if if someone's truly mad or truly yeah. making something up, yeah, then there's got to be a point at which you go, no, nah, okay, all right, let's forget about that aspect I of, made, of I my life. Or, I want to make yeah. amends with my family, but I'm going to put all of that behind me. It seems you like she suppressive. can't put all of that behind her. No, her um, kids, her family, her parents. She's actually allowed them to separate themselves from her because well, of how much she believes, you know, that this happened. And that, as as much as I'm still definitely on the fence with regards to Tonya's accounts of it all, and mm -hmm. I'm probably leaning more towards not believing her, which which I can go into in a second. But the the fact that she's so committed to the story and so committed to the encounters that she's willing to lose contact, you know, with her children, with her family. She's doubling and, down, isn't she? And essentially, yeah, she's doubling down, essentially then putting herself or being put into a, a care home to like live out the rest of her days, you know, sort of on her own. And the, 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 the audio books and stuff haven't been popular. So it's not like she's sitting on a massive nest egg. No. And she can just 
forget about her family because she's so, so she's rich. she's That's had some she's had some pretty decent jobs. I mean, from what I can understand, yeah. she was a legal secretary. You know, so oh yeah, she went dark. Um, among other yeah. things. She's no, like you say, she's not yeah. dark. No, um, but apparently she still has. Um, she receives visits from um, Indrid Cold's sons, Connor yes. and Connard. Connor so, and Connard, yes. Connor and Connard Cold. Yeah. Uh, make what you will of that. But yeah, it's... exactly. <laughs> but apparently she still receives visits from them every now and yes, then. Yes, apparently so. Yeah. Um, in the care home. Mm. Um, yeah, apparently. And uh, like I was saying, with regards to Kirk and Dana, they go and visit her. They go and in- interview her. Yes. And c- going back to what I was saying about body language and tells and such. Mm. I don't know if she believes it so much that it's not a lie or she truly is telling the truth about it Yeah, because I'm unsure. she does go on to say about having regular play dates with the kids from Lanyalos and, yeah. and such she's never actually been to Lanyalos herself but yeah, they, they would often dates, come so. to earth and mm. they'd come and play and you know, she'd explain the toys and, and everything else like that and it's sort of games that they would play like tag and you know, other and apparently they one of the details that stuck with me is that apparently Lanulos they all basically live in single story uh, houses, much like mm. the brick built ones that we have, you know, i.e. bungalows. And so when they would visit the Derenberger house, they had a two story property, and so the kids would want to play on the stairs, basically throw That's themselves right, yeah, down they... the stairs because they didn't <laughs> yeah. know what stairs were. I just thought that was quite a funny, <laughs> it's quite a funny, quite image, a funny. Really, but again, it? it's the intricacy of some of the details. Although neither of them, Tonya or Woodrow Derenberger, were daft, they didn't necessarily come across as being creative or, mm. or a creative in terms of being, you know, artistic or, you know, uh, uh, you know, an author or, or something like that. So, again, there's so many details that we've left out, which we just really wouldn't have the time to go into. But I d- <laughs> the reason why I want to believe them is because you know, even as an aspiring author, even I would would probably struggle to come up with a lot of the details mm. that they come up with and the, the the info that they went into. And so that's what I find more or, or sort of really, you know, really compelling and why I want to believe the pair of them. The only, the only thing that puts me off about Tonya is that she waited until her dad passed before she brought her book out. So there was no one, and then obviously yeah. the family have ostracized her, so there's no one else to really corroborate her story. So she's basically got free creative reign with all of the the kind of the details. No one's going to argue with her. And because her father was so popular and well-known for his story, that people were going to naturally just want to believe this because it's an extension of Woodrow's encounters. So that's, the only, that's, that's anything that would kind of put me back on the fence, I guess, with regards to her you know experiences and stuff but but no i think i mean you know by now i think the listeners would probably have made up their own mind as to what they you know kind of want to believe but you know mm. but i hope anyone who is listening you know watch the interview that we'll share a link for we'll share yep. links to the audio books you know we even put the uh the the um the manuscript for the interview as well so you yeah, can read we through it as well manuscripts, yes because that's really good i think to to read through because it gives you a, a sort of a different perspective seeing it in print as opposed mm. to just hearing him say it and how he says it. But yeah, but, I mean, you know, make up your own minds. And I'm sure you, you've, you've probably done so already by now, but I, for the most part, believe that it, that it happened, that an experience mm. or an encounter of some sort, you know, in November of 1966 happened to Woodrow Derenberger. Um, you know, whether the events of the following encounters and that, you know, did happen or, or, or happened as intently as they did, that bit, I'm oh. probably, the jury's still out for me. I think on, on yeah, that I think bit. that's the case. That's the case for me as well because there's, the one thing that I will say with regards to his book is he's, there's no sort of um, sense of time um, when he does go yeah. on these various different trips. He that's doesn't right. really give a sense of time, like how long he's gone or what he's done. Like for instance, that his wife would say, and even Tanya would say it, um, that he would go for days, weeks, and even sometimes months at a time. And they wouldn't see, they wouldn't see Woody. Um, and sometimes he'd come back and he'd know where he'd been. Sometimes he'd come back and he had no idea where he'd been. Yeah, and exactly. it's, and I don't know that, whether or not there is a huge cycle or psychiatric part of that, that maybe he's suffering from some sort of 
I don't know. There are missing some time, some missing theories. memory. There are some theories to that, yeah. um, which I thought I'd just uh, set up quite well, nice. We might as well go into those, yeah. Might as well. So, yeah, it's quite a nice setup. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's. <laughs> There's a few theories that I've that I've read out there. The the the, the sort of the, the biggest one, which I guess is I suppose the easier to believe for any people out there who does think that this is all complete nonsense, is the fact that Woodrow Derenberger was actually having an affair. Yeah. So the fact that he was, you know, out till you know all hours of the evening or morning, the fact that he was gone for days, weeks, or even months at a time with no explanation, sometimes no recollection of where he'd been or who he'd been with. Mm kind of does feed into that quite nicely, I think, to the fact that, well, he didn't want to get caught having an affair. You know, he didn't want to be sort of that guy in the community that had cheated on his wife and whatever else. So, you know, he come up with this elaborate story, which he felt would probably be either A, more believable, or B, if it wasn't, and people would just think he was a kook. So having mm. an affair would be completely left wing and no one would ever th- think of it. But- I think the only way you could possibly believe that that, story or that that theory would be true is that when you don't take into account that other people had seen yeah. lights that's um, the only that thing met that, Indrid yeah. cold that had you know mm. um not just seen the lights but seen the lights in their back garden so yeah it, in in the book woody actually says that he's when at the time of writing that he was still in contact with people that he'd considered very good friends that, that had been over when Indrid Cold had come down in the back garden in his spaceship. Exactly, yeah. You know, so there's... It's a small theory. That, and Yeah, it, but again, yeah. That's, the, that's the thing with that, though, is that he doesn't mention people by name, which no. might be down to their own wishes. Like, all right, Willie, you can publish your book, mate, but I don't really want my name in there because I don't want to be hounded like you have. Yeah, exactly. You know, which People I would fully understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd fully understand that. But what that does is, unfortunately, there's no, if there was a sense of solidarity with these people. Yeah. And you could get, and if there was a group of people that go, no, actually, we saw this happen. Mm, that's the thing. We'll, we'll stand behind our friend. We'll yeah. stand behind him. You exactly. can put my yeah. name into it. You, you can hound me, whatever you need to do. But I will. You know, yeah, people that might share his same the the, the same exactly. sort of mentality that hey, I think he that's just that. people who aren't willing to be, I guess, open minded enough to believe something like this could happen. And so I've just thought, well, do you know what? He was probably cheating on his wife, or, and, or, and or that he was and, a, you know, a closet homosexual. That was another. Well, thing, that was that the other. Cold one, was a real it? person. That Cold but was an actual man. That it was actually his Derenberger boyfriend had met, but it, yeah, it was his lover basically, and that they would go off together on weeks of you know holidays and weekends away and, and whatever else and so they come up with this elaborate idea that you know he was actually an alien because neither of them could come out with the fact well come out <laughs> neither of them could come out <laughs> neither of them could come out so yeah exactly so, so they just thought do you know what it's easier to be, be an alien, alien. <laughs> it's easier to be an alien than it is to be gay in America. <laughs> yeah, tell you what, so who's going to come out as the alien then? Who's you, gonna, yeah, who's more right. believable? Oh, well, you're you come out as the alien. You then. do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, you're you you look like a Pleiadian. You do it. You're, you're the handsome one. You do. It. Yeah. <laughs> they were. Yeah, they were sort of two of the theories that I've I sort of heard uh, or read that people try to use to kind of debunk. Discredit. Which, to be honest, I think is probably more nonsense than actually just believing that it happened because not that I ever knew Darren Berger personally, of course, but, you know, obviously listening to his audio book, listening to him in, you mm. know, in the interview and knowing what I've sort of read from his daughter and stuff, he just didn't seem or come across as that type of guy. No. And, he, and he certainly didn't leave me with that impression. If I'd sort of had a sort of edge of doubt and then heard those rumors that, Oh, he was actually just cheap. I'd be like, oh, actually, yeah, do you know what? He seemed like the type or, yeah, you get a feel for me, that, wasn't, you... that, that absolutely wasn't the case. And I actually find those theories probably less believable, as I say, than, yeah. than the, the encounter actually happening, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, so that's kind of where I am. But, yeah, I think for the most part, I do believe that he had that encounter. I believe that he met some, you know, he, he met someone or something mm. and that this happened to him. Um. It's just everything else for me. I'm a little bit. The jury's still out. I think that the, yeah. the thread gets thinner and thinner the more 
you look into it. I mean, it's compelling, you know, it's interesting and, you know, and I, I loved hearing about it all and, and kind of learning about it, but it's kind of that fine line between having enough of a story that it's credible and it's believable and adding too much to it that yeah. you start to think mm, you're I, going a little bit too far with it now. Like you, I think, sort of I think that's happened. Hole. I think that's happened a lot with regards to the the idea of Indrid Cold. I think what's yes. happened with the idea of Indrid Cold, it, to go with the other monocles that he's got, is that he's the grinning man. He's the smiling man. Yes. He, almost like he's got a creepy pasta sort of feel about creepy, it. And that's exactly, why yeah. we were initially that's my initial hook. drawn to it. That's with why we started looking into story. it. And it was actually... Yeah. And I, I've said this to you over the past weeks that we've been looking at this in that mm. I'm quite surprised by this. It's not as yeah. weird and creepy as I was expecting it to be. It's no, kind of it's not. Downplayed. Like, should yeah. we actually continue with this? You know, but yeah. as it's turned out, I think it's an incredibly interesting story. Absolutely. And yeah. I think what when you take into account as well that in that area at that time, there was a lot of activity. Um and anyone that does know anything about John Keel as well is that mm. the and the Mothman prophecies is that that there was a there was the sightings of this Mothman that were going around in that same area, along with yeah. other things. I think I can't remember what the name of it was, but it was like a beast from the woodland as well that was coming out at that time. Yeah. In that area. Yeah. Um, it's almost read like that earlier, actually, interestingly. It was like it's something, almost like a portal had opened up in that time. And, beast. Yeah, I don't know whether, yeah, like you said, like there's a portal opened up and and certain cryptids or creatures kind of found their way, th you know, yeah. through to us, or whether something happened in that area and people were just more susceptible, which allowed them to see these creatures, which have always been there, mm. but just maybe people weren't in tune with it or just weren't inclined, or you know, I, I don't it, know, but I guess it depends on who's looking. <laughs> exactly doesn't it Excellent, it yeah. depends on who's looking, who's looking. and that's yeah. that right there that i think that is a huge aspect of it you know because we so. we spoke about in in the previous episode about bigfoot being an an interdimensional sort of creature the thing with the idea yeah. of the growing glowing red eyes yeah which that we can already tell you, you the listeners that that's going to be something that's going to come up a lot with cryptids the glowing yeah. red eyes yeah. And I think that is the one thing that really does link a lot of it together is it that does. it depends on who's looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. As to, as to what you see. Yes. So it's, I don't know whether or not that's some sort of glamour or whether or not it's a I don't know. I think green that... memory or it's. Yeah, I don't know. What is it? What is it? I mean, it certainly, it certainly adds a, a romance to it. In a, in a way, if, if you know, if you know, what I mean, in, in the in the sense that oh, it kind yeah. of links it links all these things together with a, a commonality, you know, with a familiarity between all of the with all of the stories, which mm. obviously we'll be following, you know, in in you know the coming weeks. Oh, dude, um, I'm going to get more red string know. for my pin board. I'm telling you. Oh, mate, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, all, <laughs> I mean, already we're two episodes in, and we've already, you know, I know we discussed it briefly earlier, but we've already found a link between, you know, how we see or interact with Bigfoot and Indrid Cold. Yeah. Now I'm not obviously not suggesting that they're one of the same, but no, in terms no, of no, how no, we in terms of how we've seen them, how we've interacted, the you know, the sightings, um, you know, a, a, you know, and a lot of Bigfoot stuff probably would have boomed around that same time because again, Bigfoot and UFO sightings um, you know, were were kind of interlinked as well. So yeah, in in this episode, we've we've kind of got one length of red string, you know, and in, in the, and as you say, in the coming episodes, we're we're going to be adding to that string quite nicely, oh. and and this is how we believe they're all, you know, kind of linked, and it gets to a point where that adds some truth to it, I think. Um, yeah, add some weight. It's too definitely. many too many coincidences, you know, for it to for it to just be that. Do you know what I mean? It gets to a point yeah. where you have to think, come on, you know, there's got to be some. There's got to be something to it, you know, especially with, you know, um, the government declassifying, you know, files on, you know, on, on sort of Bigfoot, you know, government officials, you know, visiting Derenberger and, you know, mm. and, and talking to him about injured cold. You know, if it was all just utter nonsense, why would these people be getting involved? Because almost yeah. it's almost like adding their name to the story. 
It does. It adds credibility. So if they didn't want to add or give it any credibility, why get involved at all? Exactly. And so I think it's that whole thing of like, oh, so and so over there is talking a lot of nonsense. Just ignore them and they'll go away. Exactly. Because yeah. That is and, the truth of it. Anyone that is talking nonsense, time. talking yeah. rubbish, eventually they'll just sod off yeah. and you won't hear from them again. But the fact, like you say, that these government agencies, or I mean, maybe not the M, the, the, the men in black, I don't know what they are, no. um, whether they're, they're or government they are. Yeah. or they're an extra, yeah, or you know, whether they're mm. even human. That's because exactly. that's yeah. eventually we'll go into them we'll, as well. Yeah, we'll cover them definitely. But uh, maybe that's maybe that's worthwhile saying that what we're going to be looking into for our our next episode. Well, well, I think yeah. I mean, people will probably guessed and certainly won't entirely be surprised but um also we've mentioned john keel you know quite a lot um in this in this episode already purely just from his fascination with um injured cold and certainly that area of you know the united states point pleasant specifically but you know also west virginia um you know as we mentioned he was the author of um not, not only the Mothman prophecies, but he also provided the forward for um, Woodrow Derenberger's book on injured cold. Um, so, yeah, so episode... And, uh, and all for, with, you know, not just the Mothman prophecies, but no. a plethora of Absolutely. books about the, the paranormal, mm. his investigations. It, I mean, he... He's he a prominent was... figure in that world. Mm. That, that's, that, you know, that that's for sure. But I think he was sort of probably catapulted into the limelight with you know the mothman prophecies mm. following the real light time events that actually occurred but well, he's um, still writing books up until 2016 he was yeah yeah he well was. i say that <laughs> he had books published up until published, 2016 because yeah. yeah. unfortunately he passed um in 2009 yeah. yeah so he already had i said writing books after yeah after the grave published on yeah. beyond the grave <laughs> but yeah he's um Okay, uh, his yeah. collection of books. Um, he had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books come out after two thousand and nine. So after his death, yeah. he he had so much in the way of investigations and writing. Hmm. It's the, the the amount of credibility this this man has um, is beyond doubt. Yeah. Exactly. And I think his involvement and his sort of support of Woodrow Derenberger, I think, adds credibility, certainly for me, to his encounter with Injured Cold and the fact that it did happen. Because I don't think, you know, I don't I, I don't think Kill would have come and investigated those sightings or, or even got involved if he thought it was nonsense or was in going to mm-hmm. some way kind of diminish his own belief in, you know, the Mothman. Yeah, which we know we can say now will be the subject of uh, <laughs> of episode three. Um, that will be our next episode, which, indeed. Uh, which will you know, which will cover, which again will will no doubt mention injured I cold think... because the 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 connections between the two, um, you know, are, are quite it's not just geographical. Not just geographical. No, there's there's a lot more you know to it than that obviously we won't go into any detail now because it will, it will ruin the next episode but yeah you, you're gonna have to wait for that <laughs> you, yeah exactly you'll have to wait but um yeah if you're listening i'd certainly start getting your own red red string to you know point on your you know on your on your board because oh yeah we're going to start bringing together a lot of these cryptids which you know certainly to you know to scott and i were you know just cryptids and folklores and 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 sort of tales mm. in their own right but the more you deep dive and the more you look into these you actually start to see these familiarities and these you know these common you know sort of patterns or yes aspects of them so it's going to be um yeah it's going to be fun d- diving into that one that's for sure and it's an excuse to rewatch the film so oh indeed yeah yeah Scare Indeed, myself, I'm definitely going to witless on, uh, <laughs> on that again. So, uh... well, I will be certainly buying the book as well. I'll be buying yeah. the book. I'll be look, reading yeah. through that and seeing the the big big differences between that and the film because we all know that the, yeah. the, when the books always change when they get turned into yeah. films. Film so... producers always have a greater creative license when it comes to mm. their, their interpretation of a a book, and we already know from. 
um, Tonya Derenberger and, and and even John Kill himself that the characters within the you know the Mothman were you know sort of dramatized. There's a lot of artistic so than, license, wasn't there? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so um, yeah, so that will be coming up in uh, in in the next, next episode. Uh, the next episode is but, the Mothman. Um, it is indeed, and uh, I think that sort of nicely segues into closing off episode two. Yes. Um, I hope you've uh, hope you've enjoyed listening. I hope you've got your own thoughts and theories. And as always, reach out on the socials. Let us know what you think. Yep. Um, you know, if, if we've missed anything or, you know, if you, anything that you want to add, please let us know. And, um, yeah, all I can say is thanks for listening. And Thank uh, you very much for listening. I've been Scott. And I've been Callum. And, uh, and we've been the Cryptid Ramblers. <laughs> <laughs>